Hello scholars, welcome Professor Hinkle here. Happy to share, happy to try and inform, convince, encourage how cool all the muck at the bottom of the oceans are, or you could call this ocean sediments. So here we see a research vessel trolling around the oceans with the big drill that goes into the bottom of the ocean. And what does it pull up? A core sample. What is that sample going to show us? All of the different types of marine sediments that have been deposited at the bottom of the ocean. And what does that tell us? It tells us all kinds of things. It tells us about depositional history. It tells us about what climates were like. It tells us about what was alive. It tells us about, well, on and on and on. And that is the point of this lecture. So there's a lot here. I'm going to try not to keep us for the next six hours. Don't worry, I would never do that. But I'm going to run through some of the key points of ocean sediments. Let's dive right in. So today we are describing how sediments are ca classified based on physical characteristics. We'll get into the four main sources of marine sediments. This is a big topic. Identify organisms that produce biogenous sediments. Describe the factors that determine the distribution of sediment types in the ocean. We'll look at how we can uh, obtain sediment samples. And then a brief discussion on how to utilize biogenous sediments to reconstruct past climates. Wow, marine sediments can tell us what the climate was like in the past? Yes, and it's amazing. So... Marine sediments, I've pretty much made the case, right? Uh, they play a vital role in marine ecosystems and our understanding of ocean and geological processes. Sediments provide habitat for a myriad of different types of organisms. They contain information about the geologic past and we classify them based on their major types and where they are, their distribution on the ocean floor. This all comes together into this subset of oceanography called paleo-oceanography. And eh, you could use these words interchangeably, but paleo means old or ancient. Paleontology, the study of ancient life. Paleoclimate, the study of ancient climates. Paleo-oceanography, the study of how the ocean atmosphere and land interacts have produced changes in ocean chemistry, circulation, biology, and climate through time. And how do we know this? Well, we collect core samples from sediments in the bottom of the ocean. It's that how do you know that when it comes to geology? Usually the answer is the rocks tell us. The rocks tell stories. They're the history book to Earth's autobiography. So, here we can see a core sample with varying layers showing unique events in time. If we were to go in, we could look at the grain size, we could look at the uh, organics, we could look at what the sediments are composed of, the thickness, on and on and on. And this, among other things, will help give us an idea. So plate tectonics we've talked about really came on in the 1960s. And why is that? Proof. Alfred Wegener had this Fantastical idea. Continents move across the ocean, and people were like, yeah, right, how do they do that? Even though he had convincing lines of evidence. Well, in the 1960s, technology developed, and a quest of understanding oceans also developed. So cores, which are hollow steel tubes, like we see here, were drilled down into the ocean, and research vessels could then send a rotary drill bit that would grind up the rock and pull it back up into what is a sediment core. Those sediment cores can be lined up on tables. So avid, aspiring, and achieved geologists, oceanographers, maybe like yourself someday, could then analyze them and start to understand what's going on down there. So. 1960s, plate tectonics comes around. No surprise, 1960s, the Glomar Challenger, a deep water drilling ship is on the scene. 
It's collecting samples, and in those samples, what do we find? All kinds of cool stuff. Magnetic reversals was the big one that really supported the idea of plate tectonics that says the middle of the ocean is the divergent boundary that is actually spreading. We also learned about the bathymetry and about subsurface features, but Glomar Challenger gave us magnetic polarity sediment thicknesses and the age of the ocean floor because radioactivity has been around for about 100 years now. So this process of putting absolute dates on rocks was already well and established and then was applied to ocean exploration. The 60s gave way to the 80s. The deep sea drilling program became the ocean drilling program with the new flagship, the Joy's Resolution. Awesome. Updated technology, updated institution. Joy's the uh, joint institution for deep earth sampling with a variety of academic institutions across the nation. Basically, people started to get on board and were like, oh, this ocean stuff is really cool. Hey, I want to study it, and, and oh, I want to study it, and oh, you're studying it, and I'm studying it, so let's study together. Okay, what a great idea. And as you all know, I love diversity. I champion the idea of different people from different backgrounds sharing their ideas because this is how growth happens. This is how we will come together to solve the world's biggest problems and understand some of the world's biggest mysteries. So great. People are working together. We got a new ship. It's drilling samples. Life is good. Life goes on. About 30 years later, early to or mid 2000s, we get the integrated ocean drilling program. So what's this? Oh, I have an idea. Let's start to work with some other countries. So now we have a global collaborative effort for understanding what's going on in our world's oceans with more research vessels out. It's not easy to drill down in the bottom of the ocean and pick up samples. And to date, there's been a little over 2,000 samples that have been collected. The ocean is a big place. And so that gives us a polka dot, not even a polka dot. That would mean um, a very speckled kind of understanding of the oceans, but it's enough for us to have a really good idea. But there's so much more to learn. So scientists, sediment cores drilled from the bottom of the ocean, and there's a really cool thing. I'm going to save the review of chemistry, but atoms, actually, I'm not going to save it. Atoms are the building blocks of life. They're made of subatomic particles, and an element is defined by the number of protons in its nucleus, and its atomic mass is defined by the number of neutrons, giving us isotopes. All that to say is the relative concentration of oxygen 16 to 18 is captured in the sediments. And that ratio of oxygen isotopes that once we grind these up and we put them through a mass spectrometer and we start to uh, read the relative uh, abundance of these various isotopes, give us information on what the climate was like. So. How the heck do we know past climates? Well, we have technology to drill samples into the earth. We pull up those samples. We can interpret them using isotopic analysis to recreate past climates. I know. It's amazing. Okay, continuing on. Check out the video for the history of drilling across the world. So what is a sediment? Basically, it's any particle of rock or debris that settles to the bottom of the ocean. Over time, sediments become sedimentary rock. So ocean sediments transform into sedimentary rock through the process of lithification. It's a natural geologic process that preserves. It's like a snapshot. It's like a photograph in history of what's going on in that certain time period. Again, this is how we know what the uh, conditions and environments of Earth's history, in specific, the oceans were like. 
Three big ways to classify ocean sediments. Texture, composition, and source of origin. Let's talk about texture first. Uh, we can look at the sorting, how uniform the particles are in terms of size, well sorted versus poorly sorted. The maturity, uh, the rounding and the composition. So the more quartz minerals rounded, the more mature, the longer it's traveled, the more it's been reworked, the more amount of time mature. Like we grow up and we get mature, supposedly. And we can look at the sorting and the maturity to infer processes for transport and deposition of materials that originate on land. The big one, one of the main ways that we classify sediments is by their source. Lithogenous. It's not lithogenous. It's lithogenous. Say with me, lithogenous. Biogenous, hydrogenous, cosmogenous. Basically, pieces of rock, organisms from water, and space. Cool. Space. All right. Let's get a little bit deeper into this. Weathering breaks rocks apart into smaller and smaller pieces. These pieces are delivered to the ocean and then are dispersed in the ocean through various processes. So uh, lithogenous could also be called terogenous because about 90% comes from land. There's also subsurface uh, landslides and things going on. But for the most part, lithogenous sediments come from, it's, it's basically rocks on land that erode through the process of weathering and erosion and are delivered to the ocean. And once they get there, it happens in a few different ways. Rivers. What do rivers do? Two things. They carry water and they carry sediment. And where do they go? Ultimately, to the ocean. Because river, uh, rivers are fueled by gravity. And once you reach sea level, the gravity stops for water because the oceans are so big, they basically are the ultimate base level of the earth. For rivers that carry a lot of sediment, they will fan out into what are called deltas coarser material being deposited right here, finer material and even finer material can stay in suspension. That material in suspension, the finest material clays can remain in suspension for a very long time and then fill in the deep ocean basins. If we remember our marine provinces, continental margins, deep ocean basins, and mid-ocean ridges. Very good. Okay, proud of you. Rivers deliver a lot of sediment to the oceans. But so does wind. Wind is cool. Any uh, erosive agent, or wind is an erosive agent that is called aeolian transport, and deserts have a lot of sand that can be picked up by wind. And in fact, Saharan desert sand is transported across the Atlantic Ocean and delivers sand to the Amazon rainforest, bringing it fresh input of nutrients. Wow! Along the way, some of that sand falls into the ocean and is a lithogenous oceanic sediment. So wind is pretty cool. Glaciers can bring poorly sorted materials as glaciers grind across the surface. They pick up all kinds of chunks of rock and uh, they hold it in their clutches and their grip. And when they get to the ocean, because glaciers are frozen water, also traveling downhill, making their way to the ultimate base level, big chunks will break off. It's a process called calving. Those big chunks will raft and will travel long distances. Eventually they'll melt. And when they melt, they rain down all their sediment onto the ocean floor, thereby delivering lithogenous sediments to the marine environment. Alternatively, additionally, gravity, landslides, mudslides, avalanches, wave action along coastlines can erode the rocks that are uh, part of the sea cliff. And then volcanic eruptions can emit ash and dust and debris into the atmosphere that can then further rain down 
further delivering lithogenous or broken pieces of rock to the oceans. Okay, got it. So, lithogenous. Let's write these down. Yes. Okay, so we've got our four types. Lithogenous. Perfect. And the first type that we discussed was lithogenous. Now, composition of lithogenous rocks. When uh, the material has been eroded and eroded and eroded, quartz is the most resistant mineral in these types of sediments. And so we can say the composition of the rock is reflected from the rock which it is derived. Coarser sediments are closer to the shore. Finer sediments are further away. Okay. Rocks are cool. So is marine life that turns into rocks. So our second type of marine sediments is biogenous. Bio means life. So these are sediments that come from living organisms. Two types, macroscopic, bones, shells, teeth. Microscopic, meaning you and I can't see them, uh, creating biogenous ooze, the technical term actually, and tiny shells or tests. A test is the shell of a microscopic organism, and here we can see they come in fanciful ways, shapes, sizes. Um, when, so this is phytoplankton. This is microscopic algae and microscopic uh, organisms that eat the microscopic algae, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton. Lots of this to come in primary productivity. But all of this stuff, it reproduces. And then when it dies, it rains down. And when the accumulation of 30% or more material of these uh, remains of, of these organisms, these tests, builds up, we get what's called a biogenous ooze. It's a siliceous ooze if the organisms create silica tests, and it's a calcareous ooze if the organisms create calcium carbonate tests. So, siliceous, so organisms that create siliceous tests are diatoms and radiolarians. These are uh, members of phytoplankton. The diatoms create diatomaceous earth once they have lithified, which has a variety of commercial uses. Radiolarians are planktonic protozoans that are an important part of zooplankton. So radiolarians eat diatoms, the food web circle of life, right? Um, the diatoms are uh, photosynthesizers. And here we can see some really amazing shapes. Why is that? Why do they have these shapes? Oh, because they need to float right near the top of the surface of the water in order for the diatoms to get sunlight. And well, if that's where the diatoms are, that's where the radiolarians want to be. So they come up with these fantastical shapes, all microscopic, it's really amazing for how they are in order to utilize sunshine and nutrients, primary productivity. We're going to talk all about it. Diatomaceous earth is in all kinds of different products. It's in foods, it's in chips, it's in drinks, it's in beer and wine, liquor, it's in paint, tires, dust remover, and it has a whole variety. Now, I won't go too far into the conversation of Everything on earth is a resource. My clothes come from resources, fabrics, textiles, um, the technology, rare earth elements. That's the last slide. It's coming up, but don't you worry. Everything that we have, right? Roofing materials, building materials, technology, clothing. It's all mined from the earth and transformed in one way or another. And so marine sediments also have variable uses for humans today. Pretty cool. Carbonaceous sediments. This is a fun word to say. Cocolithophores. Really amazing shape. So cocolithophores are from cocoliths. And they, same action, right? They produce 
up in the upper layer of the ocean and in abundance they'll rain down deposit forming a calcareous ooze in dense enough qualities quantities they can form chalk rock chalk as we know it and these are the famous white cliffs of dover right here along the coastline it is a huge outcrop of rock chalk that was produced from once living organisms they're not alive anymore coco lithophores so it goes like this coco lithophores are living doing their thing reproducing and then they die as they're reproducing they form shells of calcium carbonate those shells rain down to the bottom of the ocean where it accumulates to form a calcareous ooze that calcareous ooze over time lithifies to form a sedimentary rock that sedimentary rock since it's composed of coccolithophores turns out to be rock chalk you bring a little plate tectonics some movement of tectonic plates uplift and exhumation boom bam here we go the white cliffs of dover sometimes our earth is just too incredible to even handle i know it's pretty wild okay other species foraminifera these are protozoans they can also contribute to uh calcareous ooze again there's lots of species that use carbon from the atmosphere that's pulled into the oceans this is the carbon buffering cycle that contributes to the shells of organisms that when they die, they go down, they're locked in the rock record. Again, I'm amazing myself. I hope I'm amazing you. These calcareous sediments have been discovered. These are disc coasters. They look like little stars. They're not actually starfish. They're single-celled algae that went extinct about 2 million years ago, but these deposits remain and have given us uh, an inference of areas that were once deep tropical sediments predating their extinction. So presence, their presence helps us to understand past environments, paleoclimates. Again, we're trying to tie this all into the picture of paleo-oceanography and what lived when and where and how was the planet in Earth's history. Okay, biogenous sediments are cool. Let's talk about hydrogenous sediments. Hydrogenous sediments. These ones come from water. Okay, so they're precipitating directly from seawater. Awesome. We get a whole bunch of different types. Metal sulfides, manganese nodules as seen here, phosphates, carbonates, evaporites. These are a very small proportion. The largest proportion of, hydro of, of ocean sediments are lithogenous and biogenous. And so now we sprinkle in some hydrogenous distributed in these hydrothermal environments in what are called black smokers. We've talked about these before. They're really awesome. It's specific areas of the ocean where there's fractures in the crust that water transports through is superheated dissolves a bunch of minerals those minerals come up and then precipitate out like a rainbow it sprinkles out onto the ocean floor giving us all these different metal sulfides containing iron nickel, nickel copper zinc silver some other rare earth elements these are important. We use these in our everyday life. Checking in real quick. We're all good. Okay, we use these in our everyday life, and it's awesome that the ocean has them, but is it ethical? Should we go to the bottom of the ocean and start plucking all of these metals Without knowing, remember, this oceanography thing, it's pretty recent. We thought 70 years ago the bottom of the oceans was flat. There's nothing out there. The ocean is big, it's vast, it's dumb, it doesn't know anything. Little did we know that the oceans actually are big and vast and wildly intelligent and have been around a lot longer than we have. So there are metal sulfides that are ejected out of these hydrothermal vents that deposit 
Some of the deposition is manganese nodules. These are tiny, about five centimeters, so tiny little nodules, round nodules of magnesium, iron, and some other metals that are on top of the ocean floor. It's one of the mysteries of the ocean is we're not watching these things develop and deposit. We just know that they're there. How does that happen? This could be your master's work. In fact, this could be your life work. You could solve the mystery of why are there manganese nodules on, and you might even get into the environmental side and make sure that we don't go in there and start just trolling and dredging up the bottom of the ocean without knowing the extent of the effects that's going to happen if we do that. Because doing things without knowing the effects is always a bad idea. I am of the belief of using the precautionary principle. Let's study something before we do it. As opposed to, oh, let's do that and just see what happens. Because we've done that before and it hasn't always worked out. Ocean. Oh, let's talk about the hydrologic cycle. Evaporation. Condensation precipitation, and so on and so forth. It's more complex like that than that, but a big part is evaporation. And we know from this ancient practice of salt mining that when there are dissolved ions in seawater and that water evaporates, it leaves behind though the precipitate of those dissolved ions, specifically halite or salt and gypsum, which is a very uh, important building material. These are kind of fun. What the heck are these? They look like eggs. They're called oolites. They are small rounded grains that form concentric layers around material of suspended particles, usually around in oolitic sand. And then in vast numbers, they can form uh, co high concentrations. Right now, we're finding them in the Bahamas. When you have high concentrations of oolites, they create what is called an oolitic limestone. Pretty cool, the oceans, right? And so again, these are sediments that are precipitating out of solution in water, thus hydrogenous sediments. Methane hydrate. So this is kind of interesting. This goes into our natural resources discussion here in a little bit also, but as biogenous sediments rain down to the ocean floor. They were once living, so there's still organic material. Now, fossil fuels is all about how organic material under uh, the weight of overlying material and lots of time can transform from organic material into fossil energy. And one type of fossil energy is methane hydrates that it starts down low and it finds the cracks kind of near the surface and it turns into a liquid and then precipitates out into a solid form that is unstable at the surface for long periods of time but can be uh, burned as a form of fossil energy. So this is an untapped resource for various reasons, and whether we should tap into it is a environmental ethics discussion. Um, but methane hydrates, for our purposes, is a hydrogenous ocean sediment. Okay, and last, let's see, but not least, we've got cosmogenous. This means outer space. Material from the universe that's raining down on us every single day. So we've got microscopic spherules and then large meteoric debris, meteorites that come down to Earth, specifically iron nickel meteorites. We've also got chondrites, carbonaceous chondrites. Uh, every day, the Earth is bombarded with space material, most of it too small, and it burns up in our atmosphere, thank goodness. But there's also material that makes its way through, and some impacts will of space material will smash into the earth superheated really quick and create what are called tectites they're droplets of glass composed of terrestrial silica ejected 
during these impacts. Overall, cosmogenous sediments are not a significant proportion, but every uh, year or every day that is, it's about five to 300 tons of space dust lands on the surface of the earth. And since 70% of the surface of the earth is oceans, then oceans get a lot of that material. So it's not, again, it's an insignificant amount of the overall total of ocean sediments, but it's sprinkled throughout all of them from the arrival. Okay, so we've got our classification. Lithogenous, biogenous, hydrogenous, cosmogenous. Now, where are they? If we remember back to marine environments, we've got our near shore, neuritic. We've got our open ocean, deep water, pelagic. Near shore, what do we have? It's close to land, mostly lithogenous, and quick deposition. Makes sense because rivers are pumping out the sediment, big sediment, deposits quick. Pelagic is going to be more biogenous, not a ton of biogenous and neuritic, but you've got a greater proportion of biogenous in pelagic. Finer grain sediments, because the rivers that deliver sediment here, the coarse stuff deposits, the fine stuff travels pretty far before pew, raining down to the bottom of the deep abyss. I love this figure here. Red and orange, terogenous and clay, these are both lithogenous. Green and blue, siliceous ooze, carbonate ooze, both biogenous. So for this, we're leaving out hydrogenous and cosmogenous because they're sprinkled in. And what we see is that the majority of Earth is covered by carbonate ooze. Wow. Terogenous is all around continents. Clay can settle down into deep ocean basins, and then siliceous is in these very thin bands. So the dominant biogenous sediment is calcareous ooze. So that must mean that there's a lot of organisms creating calcium carbonate tests, which creates calcareous ooze, which turns into uh, different types of sedimentary rock that are containing these biogenous sediments. But it happens in a really specific way. So if we remember that the oceans have physical characteristics, pressure increases with depth, density increases with depth, then the pressure gets so great at about four to four and a half kilometers that calcium carbonate can dissolve below a certain depth called the calcium carbonate compensation depth or the carbonate compensation depth or the CCD. Now what that means is that it can accumulate, right, and this is continental margin, deep ocean basin, mid-ocean ridge, it can accumulate at certain depths, not below it, but then as plate tectonics moves, we'll get these accumulations being buried underneath other sediments. So in the scope of deposition in the oceans, millions of years, tens of millions, the oldest oceanic crust in the open ocean is 180 million years old. So 180 million years. We've got areas where calcareous ooze is forming above four and a half kilometers, and then that area can, as we have plate tectonics moving, be buried underneath clays. It can be buried underneath other lithogenous sediments. So the simplified version is that, oh, this is where we see these sediments, but the more granular focus is that it varies with depth and we will see these when we look at our various uh, sediment core profiles. So clay, 
About 38% of ocean sediments is dominated by abyssal clays. It's really small lithogenous sediments that travels in suspension and then rains down into the deep ocean basins. Really important for providing habitat. And then also manganese nodules are right on top of these clays. It's an interesting process. Again, I can't wait to read your paper to see what you figure out about how and why that happens. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's round out our conversation with energy resources that are located in marine sediments. The big one, petroleum, petroleum, oil and natural gas. Wow, they fuel our economy, they fuel our world. We are oil dependent. And one of the sources for where we get our petroleum from is offshore oil wells offshore meaning they're not on the shoreline they're not on land and they drill down into marine sediments to sedimentary rocks where ancient organisms i kind of talked about this ancient organisms have rained down have converted their organic material into fossil energy that discussion save for another time so most important resource that currently marine sediments give us is petroleum gas hydrates methane hydrates this is another fossil fuel they form on the seafloor um, there's lots of deposits on continental shelves if we look at existing resources fossil fuels are about a quarter other is about a quarter about half is in these gas and methane hydrates they're the largest store of usable organic carbon but they rapidly decompose they are unstable so the question is should we invest in gas hydrate energy or should we invest in alternative uh, new and renewable energy well that's another environmental discussion but the science is such that there is a vast reserve of gas hydrates that is unstable and it is available uh, storing incredible amounts of carbon in marine sediments other resources salt really important gypsum used in drywall really important we can uh, harvest aggregate sand and gravel to make concrete to help fuel the building of our future we've got phosphates manganese nodules now these manganese nodules have lots of metals we need metal, copper for our wires, lead and aluminum, uh, but there's a high cost, there's political issues. Who owns the bottom of the ocean? Do you? Do I? Does our country? Does California? Does nobody? Does everybody? So it's a political issue. And then the environmental ethical concerns for mining the deep sea. Because technology and all the cool fancy contraptions that we have need a slew of these rare earth elements with these names I can barely even pronunciate but they're necessary for technology and in this age of technology our technology is not going away anytime soon and in fact I or one could make the argument that technology is going to help solve some of our big environmental problems. We need technological solutions and we need the raw materials for powering the technology that can take us into the future. So the seafloor is a potential area to provide us with these rare earth elements. It may have more deposits than are on land. And again, this brings up a whole slew of environmental concerns outside of the scope of our conversation. But to tie this all in together, the oceans have resources that are available for us. Whether we utilize them or not is another discussion. So in conclusion, ocean sediments vary based on texture, composition, and source of origin. Our sources being land, organisms, water, and outer space. Ocean sediments hold information on Earth's history, and these sediments contain natural resources that could be 
what we need to survive into our future, often overlooked, very misunderstood, probably not even thought about. Ocean sediments are wildly important to our understanding of Earth and our functioning as humans on this planet, the only one that we've got. So let's respect them. Let's honor them. Let's acknowledge them. Thank you. I respect you. I honor you. And I acknowledge you making it all the way through the depth of our lecture. Have a great day.